Are you building an X99 workstation and you want 10 gigabit ethernet? Well, you want to see this right after the bump. All right, so today we're going to take a look at the X99 WS-E 10G. Now, this is a server grade ASRock motherboard or server workstation, I should say. And its claim to fame is that it's got 10 gigabit ethernet. And this is not, you know, crappy 10 gigabit ethernet. These are Intel X510 server adapters basically built in. So this thing has quad network ports, two gigabit and two 10 gigabit. That's all copper. Um, this motherboard is designed for both Windows Server 2012 R2. And as you'll see in our testing, we used Linux. We used Ubuntu Linux because it was, you know, sort of lowest common denominator. Um, and it worked really well. Uh, the hardware features on this motherboard is that it's got the ASRock Super Alloy, the extra, extra large aluminum uh, alloy heat sink. So, you know, ample cooling. It's got a premium 60 amp uh, power choke, uh, premium memory alloy choke, uh, ultra dual in MOSFETs. It's got the Nishion 12K Platinum Caps, and it's got this new Sapphire Black PCB. So the, the PCB is basically completely black except for the blue parts, and you'll see that. So this motherboard, being sort of a, a enthusiast workstation motherboard, you could even see it in single socket, single CPU socket servers. Uh, it supports both the Intel Core i7 and the Xeon E5 1600-2600 V3 uh, processor family. Now the 1600, the only real difference between the 1600 and the 2600 is that the 2600 series Xeons can be used in dual socket motherboards, whereas the 1600 series Xeons can only be used in single socket motherboards. This motherboard is a single socket, so unless you just have a 2600 V3 laying around, you really should just use the 1600 series processor. Now of course this has the digital power design, it's a 12 phase power design. It supports quad channel DDR4 3200 plus, that's overclocked, with a maximum capacity up to 128 gigs. It supports DDR4, uh, UDIM ECC, RDIM uh, ECC, uh, but uh, the ECC support comes with the processor. So you'll have to use a Xeon processor if you want ECC memory support. Otherwise, you're relegated to DDR4, um, not error correcting memory. That and that'll go with you know the i i7 2011-3 CPU that you're going to put in here. Now it's got seven. PCIe 3.0 by 16 slots. So that'll do four-way SLI and four-way crossfire by 16, supported by uh, PLX 8747 bridges. It's got integrated 7.1 channel HD audio with uh, content protection. That's powered by a Realtek ALC 1150. Uh, it supports Purity Sound 2.0 and DTS Connect. Now it has two 10 gig LAN ports, as I mentioned before. Those are uh, from the uh, those are those are actually the Intel X540, and then two gigabit LAN that's supported by the Intel i2 uh, 210AT. And uh, you can also use the Intel Quad LAN uh, with teaming function. And so when you install the Intel software, it will let you create the team for these. Sometimes uh, you don't get that from the consumer grade uh, NICs or if you just buy a desktop NIC, it's like, oh, I can't let you make this as part of a team because this is not a server grade NIC or whatever, even though it's just a software limitation. This has 12 SATA 3 ports, one eSATA port, one SATA Express, one M2, that's PCI. E Gen 2 by 4 and uh, SATA 3 are available in the M.2 slot. And then it's got uh, one SATA daughter module option. So you can get a, you know, a uh, sort of a disk on chip module and, and, and run it off this thing. It has the power header for that and, and that sort of thing. That really is something useful if you're going to put this thing in like a 1U uh, server rack case or something like that. It has eight USB 3.0 ports. That's four at the front and four at the rear. It's got eight USB 2 ports. That's four at the front and four at the rear. It has one USB disk on, uh, disk on module thing. So basically that just means there's a USB port internally. Uh, and then it also supports the ASRock full spike protection app shop full HD UEFI, that, that sort of thing. So we'll, we'll dive into those features in a minute. Now for the accessories that come with the motherboard, it's pretty standard fare. You get two, three, four way SLI bridges. Uh, you've got three packs of SATA cables and then you've got the back plate. Now if I had to complain about one thing, it would be that the uh, motherboard does not include a USB 3 breakout header. Well, why, why does that make sense? Well, there's four USB 3 ports at the back of the motherboard and there's four for the front headers. Not a lot of cases include provisions to handle four front USB 3 ports, so I would have liked to have seen a breakout cable included. At the bottom edge of the motherboard, you've got the HD audio connector for the front panel, and you've got the Purity Sound Nishion Fine Gold Series audio caps. Next to that, you've got a Molex connector for extra power if you're gonna run four-way SLI. Uh, next to that is an RS-232 serial port header, 
Then you've got a Thunderbolt connector, and then you've got some uh, LED headers for the, uh, the LAN connector. So if you have your case has front uh, lights for your LAN. Then you've got a four-pin fan header, and then USB headers. Just past the USB connections, you've got the front panel connector, and then you've got an LED readout above that. Uh, the LED uh, readout is like the boot time diagnostic codes. Then you've got an onboard hardware uh, power and reset button. Then you get this nifty little AB switch. So what does that do? Well, this thing has two BIOSes, BIOS A and BIOS B. That's something you've probably seen before. Uh, it's nothing new in terms of, of motherboards, but the A and B switch here lets you switch between those two BIOSes. The chips are also socketed, so you could remove a BIOS chip and reprogram it if you had to and something else. Then you've got this SATA Zero connector, which is for like the disk on module connector so that uh, sometimes you see this in especially one U or compact server cases there would be just a solid state disk that would plug into this kind of an arrangement uh, and the four pin connector there is not a fan four pin connector it supplies power to the disk module you can see a three pin fan header just around the edge though uh, right before we start getting into the SATA ports just above all this, you can also see the M.2 slot. Now, this M.2 does provide both PCI Express and SATA, and you can see that the motherboard has several different mounting holes depending on what length of M.2 that you've got. So, this is nice. You can run an M.2 module off this board. Now, this motherboard has plenty of SATA connectivity. Look at all the SATA ports on the front edge of this. My goodness. There's uh, one SATA Express port on the bottom there, and then this uh, <laughs> plethora of SATA connectivity is punctuated on either side by three-pin fan headers. And then uh, just past that, you can see the two front USB 3 headers. Just past that, you've got the 24-pin ATX power connector, uh, TPM connection uh, header, I believe, if you need to run the TPM module or something like that. And then up here in the corner, you've got the four-pin and an auxiliary three-pin that are meant for the CPU fan. So if you have a push-pull CPU cooler, well, this has got connectors for both. Although, only the primary one is a four-pin CPU fan header. Now, most of the rest of the motherboard layout is dominated by two huge aluminum heat sinks. Now, one is on the south bridge and has a fan, and it's a very small fan. And the other heat sink is on the VRM, and it seems to be designed to carry heat out the back of the motherboard. Now, the rest of the layout, it's a pretty standard layout. You know, you've got four DDR4 RAM slots on either side of the the processor there's nothing really new there um asrock has taken some steps to lower the profile of this particular cpu socket which is useful if you're going to stuff this atx motherboard into a 1u rack mount case that seems to be one of the use cases that their r&d folk have designed around now just below the cpu socket there's also a full-size usb port so you could plug in a usb flash disk if you're going to use a uh, you know, a hypervisor like ESXi and you want to have the USB disk that has the hypervisor installed on it completely internal to the machine. Although if you're going to be using a larger heat sink with this machine, you're probably not going to be able to use that USB port. I think the placement of the USB port is unfortunate, especially if you're going to run a larger cooler like a Noctua or something like that. There's also a, a Molex power connector that can supply extra power to the PCI Express uh, slots if you're going to run devices that use a particularly large amount of PCI Express power. Okay, the first gigabit ethernet port also has two usb 2 ports right below it then you can see the four usb 3 ports at the back uh, next to that and then right below the the two usb 3 ports there's a little button that'll reset the cmos then you've got your other uh, one gigabit uh, ethernet adapter and then you've got two more usb 2 ports then you get your eSATA connector and then there are those two 10 gig ethernet adapters <laughs> yay then you've got your, you know, your audio connector. Now the audio connector also has optical, so you can run optical audio, but then you've also got your analog connections there as well. And that's uh, from the Purity Sound, the onboard Purity Sound, which is the Realtek uh, uh, adapter. And that's a 115 dB signal to noise ratio DAC with a differential amplifier. It also has a TI-NE 5532 premium headset amplifier. That's direct drive technology, and then it's got this little EMI shield. It also has the PCB isolation uh, stuff done to it so that's nice all right so it's not every day that you get to play with a motherboard that has 10 gigabit ethernet built in so of course we need to throw a chip in here boot it up and take it for a spin so we're going to take a look at the uefi and see what asrock has got under the hood uh and that they've done how they've improved the uefi in this thing and, and sort of what the features are now looking around the uefi um there's a pretty much good coverage for all the features that i would expect you can really tell that asrock has put a lot of work into the UEFI that's on this motherboard. You know, this is, uh, the, we're gonna test it with a 5960X that I know will hit four gigahertz. We were able to hit four gigahertz, no problem. 
uh, on this motherboard, so it's a decent overclocker. Although this is aimed more at the workstation market, uh, and I would say that you know you should consider running a Xeon if you're going to run this board. Now, of course, it'll work fine with the i7. We did some of the testing here on the video with the i7. We also tested it with a Xeon and some ECC memory, and it was it was pretty stable, pretty flawless there too. So it does have overclocking features, and it does have some uh, handy. Uh, tools to help you get a little bit better uh, tuning and better performance out of it if you're interested in overclocking. Uh, and it has some tools to help you, you know, sort of read the specs from your memory and see what devices you've got installed to give you a little picture of the motherboard and, and you know, show you where everything is connected and, and, and that kind of thing. It has online management guard and some other features like that. It also has the ability to update the UEFI from within the UEFI over the internet. And so there was no UEFI available uh, when I was doing the video. Aww. And I didn't want to fool with trying to, fl uh, trying to flash an old version of the UEFI just to see what that process looked like. I did notice that um, uh, in the release notes history, the UEFI servers had changed. Uh, it, I, 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 it, so I guess that wherever they were <laughs> downloading the files from, that server went offline or something. And so there was a UEFI update to change where the UEFI looked for updates. So I guess that's cool. The UEFI can phone home and, and you know, update if you elect to do that, uh, which is interesting. I think it sort of makes the process a little easier than, you know, downloading a file, putting it on a USB stick, and then sort of booting from that. So the other thing that I wanted to take a look at was... Um, the fan configuration and the fan information. And so there is actually a full fan controller in here, although it's a little quirky. Let's take a look. So this is the fan expert software. Now this software is a little quirky. Uh, when you change the profile and you hit apply, it does not actually apply it until you restart. So I was in here and I was like, I'm not seeing a fan RPM difference between silent and performance. It's not really nothing's really happening uh it does have a customize and you can go into customize and and you know set your set points and and see what's going on but it doesn't seem to provide a temperature readout of what the current temperatures are so this is a little bit fiddly i really think that they could put a lot more uh, polish on this and get a much better user experience for this so it is nice that you can customize it but it kind of sucks that you have to reboot the computer. And remember, there's only two four-pin headers on here, one in the top right of the motherboard and one at the bottom edge of the motherboard. So keep that in mind when you're picking uh, you know, your, your cooling fans. The other fan headers are all three-pin, and I really couldn't tell if it was using PWM or DC control uh, on the other three-pin connector that was next to the CPU. So you know, keep that in mind when you're doing cooling fan selection for your build with this motherboard. Well, that's been the overview of the X99WS-E slash 10G. Now, we've actually got some other coverage of this coming up. We put Linux on this, and we put it through the paces. You can kind of see that in some of this video that we were using uh, Ubuntu for server-type tasks and Intel, uh, you know, 10 gigabit performance and doing things with jumbo frames and those kind of things. Uh, with all the testing that we did, we even did some torture testing. This motherboard was very stable. It was very solid. I'm very pleased with the results on this motherboard. This seems to be a pretty solid um, workstation motherboard at a pretty good price point. So if you are thinking about building a workstation and you want something that's powerful without being you know, too loud and you really want onboard 10 gigabit Intel Ethernet, this is a motherboard for you. Take a look at it. Let me know. If you got one and you've built a machine with it or you have any questions, you know, come on over to the forums at techsyndicate.com and let us know. This is Wendell signing out. Mm -hmm.